This is iFanboy Pick of the Week, number 854, brought to you by iFanboy listeners just like you, boss. Hey, welcome to iFanboy Pick of the Week, episode 854. I am Josh Flanagan, and here with me is my co-host. I I spun out on those words. This is my co-host, Connor Kilpatrick. Hello, Josh. Hi there. Hi. We are... Come on, pep it up a little bit. We're here to do a show for the people. It takes like 20 minutes to get going. <laughs> so it's just enough to get halfway through the pick. Yeah. We are I fanboy. Every week one of us picks a book. We talk about that book for too long. We talk about the other books for too long. Mm-hmm. We call that pick the pick of the week. That's why it's it's showed that. You really just used the template from last week. I did. I didn't even look. <laughs> we talk about other <laughs> books from the week. I put some stuff in the script, and it's still there. And I was like, that's yeah. weird. This feels familiar. Uh, we'll talk about other books from the week. We'll talk about the patron pick. There's a uh, listener mail if we can do that. Um, there will be spoilers for your books. Connor, you had the pick. I did, and it was a good week. It was a solid week. I, I enjoyed it. But it w- there was nothing that like blew me away when I finished reading. There was nothing like, oh, man, that was great. There was a lot of really solid, fun reads. And mm-hmm. so when I finished... I didn't have a pick right away, and so I had to really think for a, a bit about what I enjoyed the most, what made me the happiest. And when I did that, I came up with Dark Knights of Steel, number eight from DC Comics, Tom Taylor, Yasmin Putri, Arif Prianto, and Wes Abbott. And this is its the end of Act 2, beginning of Act 3 in Tom Taylor's DC Comics fantasy story. We're in a little bit of a fantasy kick here at iFanboy, yeah. coupled with this week's Media Splood. We've been enjoying this miniseries. This is the first issue was also pick of the week. It has been a fun world building, fun character stuff that Tom Taylor's known for. And this issue had some really great moments. I really enjoyed the Oliver Queen, Dinah, Lance meeting in prison quite a bit. That's probably my favorite scene in comics this week. And what you had here was an exciting tension-filled build-up to all-out war amongst the kingdoms with the confrontation between the the Amazonian and the House of El culminating in the brutal death of uh, Queen Hippo, Hippo, Hippolyta. Queen Hippo. Hippo, Hippo, Hippo. You know what I'm saying. I've been loving this story, and now we're finally at the point where it's all going to break loose. You know, this is eight issues into a 12-issues miniseries, so that's, that's you know, Act 2 is now done. And, you know, this is what one of those few comics where there is literally no idea what's going to happen next. This doesn't follow any of the rules. People can die. People can live. This is a fantasy setting with DC characters. I don't know how this is going to end. And it's, that's a fun, exciting thing. And, again, it's filled with all the great Tom Taylor moments. I liked the Supergirl, Wonder Woman friendship, the appearance by Poison Ivy, which led to some terrific dynamic work from Yasmin Putri, who we've been enjoying. She hasn't drawn every issue, but she's the main artist. She's been, been terrific. The, really, I really enjoyed the fight scene in the, among the vines, you know, hacking yeah. away at the vines that are attacking. That was really well done. And again, the Ali Dinah scene was just, they're just magic, those two. Well, I mean, the question is, why haven't they put Tom Taylor on a Green Arrow book? Because clearly, <laughs> clearly he loves this character. You know, yeah. it, it heavily featured... And actually, they're doing the same thing. He's heavily featured over in um, uh, DC versus Vampires too. Like yeah. he's like the, I don't know. The, the, there's he's been some sort of keystone in DC for a while, where we're yeah. like he's 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 a, you know, except for when Bendis tried to use them as the head of uh, Checkmate, which was dumb. But even then, yeah. like his character was really strong and had a point of view. And but anyway, like you know, like you said in in DC. And then in this, like his relationship, you know, with with Dinah has has really been one of the highlights of both of those series, and, and clearly he's got an affection for the characters. You know, if you think back to the Green Arrow and Black Canary book that we loved that Judd Winnick did, you know, they were always banging, and it was like you know, kind of a joke. But like, wouldn't you if you had this chemistry? Like, they are on fire all the time. Yeah. And also, look at that scene. Look at page seven. Look, at, we we talked a lot about. Yasmin Putri's page layouts and her dynamic angles. I mean, look at that overhead shot through the bars where you can see both of them, but the bars are sort of the main focus. It's, yeah, that's it's, great. It's really interesting panel stuff and great shadows. On that same page, the last two panels are them. They're talking to each other, but they're looking in different directions because they're separated. Yeah, it's really great. That's nice. That's Again, that's really subtle. 
And the colors from, from RF Prianto also really yeah. help. The, there's a nice warm sort of candle or torch glow because it's a fantasy setting, so there's yeah. torches. It's just a beautiful looking scene. It's really yeah. good. And if you keep going to the next page, you know, bars are an obvious, you know, great visual metaphor for things like this. But Frames and frames. Just really great. The shadows on the walls. Even the, the bricks make kind of a bar mm-hmm. on the walls. So they're just constantly surrounded by these lines. It's really wonderfully well drawn so yeah. even if you know ollie has douchey facial hair it doesn't matter he kind of always has douchey facial hair yeah that's that's a given it may change but i mean here this is this is the best he can do with rudimentary <laughs> Bar- dark ages i was gonna say barbarism but that's a different kind of thing and razor technology yeah <laughs> barbasolism he doesn't have any Harry's blades, that's for sure. No German no. engineered blades for. Hey, 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 hey! <laughs> Sorry, I'm they not were... paying for it. Let's give it away. <laughs> I did buy some soap yesterday. Yeah, I, I've got a package <laughs> coming this week. Anyway, that was a that was a free ad for Harry's. <laughs> Listen, when you believe in the product, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sad to see this go because we've been enjoying this. We've been enjoying the side books, the little specials here and there. I'd be happy if this continued on in the DC's vein where we get further miniseries i don't know if it's as popular as deceased deceased turned out to be i mm-hmm. probably very unexpectedly was super popular and we've gotten years and years out of it but i've been enjoying this as much as i've been enjoying deceased i feel like this grew on you though a bit more well the first issue was pick of the week yeah i guess so i don't know because deceased and dc versus vampires all kind of exist at the same time and then when this came out uh he had a taylor had a very similar series over at marvel correct and it's just kind of a crowded field but all of those things have delivered actually the marvel one was probably the worst out of all those but it was still still fun fun. just wasn't as deep because there's only six six issue yeah yeah he really needs time to really build the world yeah i didn't know what the pick was gonna be you sent the list and i went yeah okay Okay, a lot a lot happened too. Like I think there was a little while we're like, okay, what now? And I think with the end of the last issue or two, we're like, okay, now things have happened. They're moving forward. There's this really interesting thing going on with is it Supergirl? It, yeah. it is, right? Yeah. yeah. Like we don't know what the fuck's going on with her. She's been involved in several murders now. <laughs> well, I mean, at the end, you know, you had Lara, Superman's mom, show up and murder Hippolyta. Right. Just, just brutally, and a Tom, and a, you know, Tom Taylor. We don't talk enough. Of, you know, he does great character work. He does really interesting stories. But he also does really brutal superhero murders sometimes, in the same way that Jeff Johns used to back in, in the old days. Well, he'll take them away from you when you don't expect yeah. it, and you know, like two unexpected things. You don't expect that character to die, and you don't expect the character who did it to do it. So, you know, you got to... And what does this do for Wonder Woman's involvement? What does it do for Wonder Woman's involvement on the side of the House of L? Right. Because as Lara is shaking Hippolyta's hand, she she, uh, heat visions her in half and and ends up holding the arm, which is brutal. I didn't know you could... I wasn't sure you could do that to an Amazon. Are they Amazons? I don't know. Well, you know, they're just... She's not made of clay, though. She's she's god flesh. Yeah. (laughs) Really fun. If you're if you're a fantasy fan, this is definitely worth checking out. It's a really well done fantasy book. Mm-hmm. I agree. As much as you can do in terms of world building in these in the limited amount of space they have in comics, uh, and also John Constantine is a very big presence in this particular story. Although I will say he's the one, he's one character who I was I was not quite. I, I was trying to figure out how sort of connected he is to the standard universe john constantine and i had a little Mm -hmm. bit of a hard time with it i know tom taylor can write that character Mm -hmm. but i i can't tell where he's coming from he's you know i guess the thing is that that got me about is that he's very devoted to his side and that feels very unconstantine to me i guess you know what i'm saying right but but i also don't trust that what we're seeing is what's happening yeah Mm. it's really fun yep i've been enjoying tom taylor's different excursions into dc using different genres and different alternate takes on them it's been a lot of fun but there was a lot of fun comics this week including she hulk 170 rainbow Rowell, luca maresca we have the aftermath of she hulk and jack of hearts have begun their sexual relationship oh a sexual relationship and, wow, there's, there's literally three pages of pillow talk there is and then you know we had that the aftermath of that and then but she's got to go to work on a saturday so she's gonna leave him leave him and that led to my favorite page turn of the week in which awesome Andy, the android robot who owns the law firm she works at, says, there's, there's a client here to see you. And she's like, who is it? Turn the page. 
and it's Doctor Doom in a suit with a cloak. But it turns out it's not actually Doctor Doom, but it was a great page. Well, this turn. is like these are both. This is a, a takeover from the Runaways series. Doombot was yes. in that series with, with Victor Mancha. Before we get there, though, I want to say that my favorite panel of the week, and it's not particularly amazing, but he's uh, Jack of Hearts is talking about what he's going to do, and, and he's like, "I'm planning all sorts of things. I'm going to get into carbs too. I might already be there." Or I'm going to do paleo or keto, whichever. And then he goes, I'm going to have to work out all the time just to fit into your clothes. And then I'm going to start complaining about my knees and my shin splints. And I was like, I hear you, Rainbow. I hear you, Rainbow. I got you. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that Runaways run was was fantastic. And it got mm-hmm. better and better. And and Doombot, and I, you know, written here, what a, what a really fun point of view of a character. And how he's like, he's, I'm Doom. I know I, I'm not supposed to say, I'm Doom. Like, he can't help it. Because he's just trying to run around his programming, you know, what he was made to be versus what he is. And I like those. I love I love robot autonomy <laughs> like done in a, in, a, in a good way. That got him in legal trouble. So he's being right. he's being uh, charged with doom crimes because he says, I am doom, but he's not doom. So that's why they need a lawyer. And that's that's interesting. Yes, it fun. is. In the context I, of the Marvel Universe. I thought the lawyer stuff was pretty good. It was like not so heavy that it felt real, but it was thoughtful enough that I was like, OK, you're not just flinging this up against a wall. I really enjoyed Doombot pounding the desk in frustration on page 15. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I am doomed. Also, the, I think the, the fun with uh, Awesome Mandy's sign yeah, uh, great. Doesn't, doesn't get old. Lots of comedy in that. Yeah, This book is terrific. It's it really is, terrific. and, and it, it delivers, it started before the TV show, but I think that it delivers a lot of what the TV show does mm-hmm. and vice versa. You know, when the TV show was over and I came back and read this, I was like, ah, oh, I, I recognize this. Now, the character isn't exactly the same. The circumstances are a little bit different. But I think the tone, the way that, you know, this is an older Jennifer, a more a mature, experienced yep. one. So she's not hit with all that same, you know, self-doubt and stuff. And thank God for that, by the way. Yeah. But, you know, it gives you that that feeling that you want from it. It's a good, we, you know, I think we've actually been lucky. There's been quite a bit of pretty good She-Hulk books that pop in and come and go. I hope this one hangs out longer than some of those did. You remember that great Charles Soule? Yep. Oh, who drew it? Uh, the Spanish artist. He was amazing. He was super, he was really beautiful. I can't think of his name. Yeah. I, I just, at this point, it's like anytime I enjoy a book, I just assume anytime it's going to go away at any moment. Yep. Our tastes are too arcane. She had a hell of a run on Runaways. It went mm-hmm. for a good long time. You know, this has a TV show behind it. I don't know if that spurs book sales or not, but it's not so different that people couldn't pick that up. I hope so. Yeah. So I hope so. And she's it's I one mean, of my favorite books. You know, her heart's way in it. The art's great. I mean, the coloring is kind of the strongest part of the whole thing. Like, oh, the coloring's like beautiful. The coloring right? completely sells it. And we spent a lot of time talking about Luca Maresca, who's, who's really, really good. And yep. again, with this issue, solid romance character work solid action stuff in the end where she ends up in in that laboratory with the tiny woman freaked me out also i will say there's little captions when she opens the door april we don't know anything about april so i didn't have that like wait what do i remember her i didn't have to mark we know even less about him like just those little captions made it go much smoother because i didn't have to worry like wait do i have to go back and look do i have to remember it doesn't matter so you messaged me in the middle of the week and said don't miss out on hulk Mm-hmm. Hulk 777, Donny Cates, Ryan Otley, basically the Invincible right? art team, Cliff Rathburn, Sonia Obeck, Mark Tay, Gracie. I read it. What were you referring to? <laughs> I, I just thought after all of that really confusing Hulk ship, Thor, place, you know, space planet, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, it, it sort of brought it back to, and I just thought it was really fun. I thought that... The bits in the beginning, while they were a little uh, melodramatic, I thought they sort of sold a point about you know how this version of Banner feels. Uh, it's this exact same story as what Jeff Johns did with um, Barry Allen, I think, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, more or less. Yeah. And I liked that it had a little of, like, it was like a nice maestro. Like, he goes to this planet because of his thing. Everybody has been gamma rated. It almost felt like a little short story, you know, that, that had the Hulk in it. You know, and they're all super into Hulk, and we find out that, you know, in in top typical comic book fashion, the Bruce Banner part of his brain is going to die. You know, according to the scans that they did, and they can't tell anybody. But like all the all the there's there's like gamma monsters, mm-hmm. you know, 
everywhere and and they're super into Hulk and you kind of can't tell where they're coming from. I like the story of the planet that they just these people all got gamma radiated and they just fought and raged for millions of years and then they turned it into an arable planet and soil and they got happy. You know, and, and I don't know, it's just I thought it was a really fun. Like if this was two or three issues it'd be fantastic. It just felt big and mm-hmm. spacey and compared to what this has been where I've enjoyed it, but I, I wanted it to come to earth sort of metaphorically. Yeah. I just got done with it and I was just like, oh, that's really fun. And I didn't expect it. I thought I was like, all right, we're going to, we're going to fight through some more of this Starship Hulk, you know, but it was, they put him on the ground, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's, it's for me, it's tough because I still think the foundations of the story are shaky. Like I don't enjoy this Starship Hulk story or mm-hmm. this idea. I don't, it confuses me. I don't understand the rules. If it's just plain old Hulk doing this, I might have a better grasp and I might be enjoying this more. But this was one of the better issues they've had in a while. Maybe that was, yeah. I just find the different banner in that head driving a starship and all the stuff. It's just it's overly confusing, and I don't think. But it that was way in the story. back for this issue. I know, but it's still there. I'm just having a hard time. Like, I, don't I get know. it, I, but at the same time, I do. I like the audacity of the thing. Like, I didn't really like King in Black because I don't care about Venom, but I do like the audacity of the hugeness of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and he did that in the Thor run too, which was you know like. Uh, Galactus became, you know, he became Thor, the Donald Blake thing. Yep. I don't like all the choices, but I do love the size and the audacity of the choices that are being made. And Donny Cates is willing to do this with, you know, the main Hulk book. And, you know, it's great stuff for Otley to draw. Oh, I mean, yeah. Otley really got to, like, it was a it was a performance, I think. Planet you know, of Hulks it was right up his alley. Yeah, and, and, you know, he's got exactly the right kind of style for this kind of book. There's one page in here where they have to do the huge explanation, and it was like hitting a brick wall when you read it. But besides that, it's fine. <laughs> I just, I yeah, I, I mean, I think that I've been hoping for this book to deliver something, and at the end of it, I go, oh, that was really fun. I want to know what happens next. Right. It gave me some of that maestro feeling, I right. think, which I wanted more of. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice that there's more here that meets the eye. It's not just this planet that sort of worships him because he... He helped in its creation. It's I don't trust this leader. No, you know, there's something going on here. But I'm hoping that I, that there's a twist. But then the twist is a twist. Sure. Yeah. I did not enjoy it, but I finished it. I was like, huh. I wonder. I wonder what what it was that Rush Josh loved yeah. that so much. It makes sense. It was. It was just fun. It was just a fun. It was. It was lots of gosh. I thought. Yeah. Charles Soule and Will Sliney. And I meant to look this up before we before, to make sure. But Will Sliney did the Rocketeer series that we just. Mm. Red, correct? That's a, I knew his name was from somewhere. I mean, I know that he's an Irish artist. I know I've seen it around. And I was curious going into this. I had no idea what it was going to be. It's called Hell to Pay, number one from Image Comics. And it's a fairly well-constructed book in which this could be a Hellblazer story, kind of. A bunch of uh, hell money, hell coin, devil, what is it, whatever it is, is taken out of hell at some point in the past. And it is on Earth and super rich people use it for different things and then there's this other story it's very complex but i was kind of impressed that it was laid out well enough that by the end of the issue i was totally on board and while the issue itself self was still compelling i thought it was a really wonderful construction to to explain to me what this really complicated thing was that was going on did you read this am i talking to myself okay there's a page in here where there's like a fight on the, some stairways, it's a double page spread, yeah. and all of the panels go down and to the left as they go down these stairs, and the action sort of goes back and forth, and it's a little confusing, but yeah. I thought it actually still worked really well. It's a great visual. It's a real big foreshortening problem at the end. Yes, and that that's not. I don't think that's that's. I don't think the uh, figure drawing and anatomy is Sliney's strong point, but I think that what he does do is bring in a lot of energy and emotion. You know, some of it was very, like, arch and broad, but I I think that kind of fits with it. I enjoyed it, kind of despite myself. I'm not even sure why I enjoyed it. I think it could go off the rails, but I know that Soul's incredibly thoughtful about how he approaches these stories. And I was reading it, and I kind of thought, you know, he doesn't doesn't need to do this. Mm. You know, like, he's got a novel career. He could, you know, he could coast on stuff, and he keeps putting out... He's as long as I've known of his work and known him, he's put out interesting creator owned stuff. And it doesn't always have to be great, but it, at least like there's no half assing of any kind. And this doesn't really read like a pitch. It would be difficult to be like, oh, this is a movie. This feels like a comic book to me. And I like that. 
I thought this was terrible. <laughs> I, I could tell. <laughs> if you had told me this was a new new comic writer trying to figure out how to write comics, I would have believed you. I was really? shocked that this was Charles Soule, who's a really accomplished writer. I thought this was terrible. Huh. I thought the characters were awful. I thought the dialogue was awful. The art didn't help. I struggled to finish this. Well, I do not think it was perfect in any way, but I, I found myself, like the premise at the beginning, I was like, this is kind of dumb, but I was interested. I can't, you know, I, I, can't, uh, I can't deny that. I just can't believe it's Charles Soule. I was, I was surprised, really surprised. I hated all the characters. The guy especially was really bad. With his dumb haircut? No, I mean, like, he, he, was, he, he kept writing was this guy being incredibly angry that the billionaire was trying to sleep with his wife, and that was the entire point of their operation. You know, he kept, like, well, you tried to sleep with the love of my life. Like, yeah, you, you sent her in there to seduce him. Like, what do you expect? I'm an asshole because the Rocketeer Great Race uh, was by Stephen Mooney, who was in that same community of Irish comic book artists. Mm. Anyway, this I thought this was really, really bad. But Fair enough. That's fine. It's okay. <laughs> I enjoyed it. So, so Bendis is firmly ensconced in Dark Horse now. That's where Jinx World is. That's where his books have been coming out. And we had a new series start called The Ones, written by Bendis, drawn by Jacob Edgar. And I like this. This felt like old Bendis in a way. It was lighthearted. It was fun. It had a high concept. It did feel like old Bendis, but it also felt moderner. I, I don't know how to I don't know how to phrase that. Like I was like if, I was like it's, it does feel like it used to be, but it feels like it's been developed, or at least it's not the same thing he would have put out forever ago while still having his voice. It's actually old Bendis and old Bendis. It's like right. Old Bendis, but not what young Bendis would have written. Right. If that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. That's yes. what I was sort of thinking. Yeah. I liked it. I don't know that I put my finger on it yet, but no. it was enjoyable to read. And there was an interesting twist at the end where the plot jumped ahead like six years, which I wasn't expecting. <laughs> it, was, it was a good smash cut. It was a funny cut where a bunch of people who are the chosen ones for various reasons have been brought together. By this guy. And we're going to get to this guy in one second because I have a lot to say about him. And so there's prophecies and there's like, what are we fulfilling here? And it's mostly just an excuse to get a bunch of different people into a room and have a bend to see the time. Where it's they a talk. lot of people. Yeah. I mean, that was the most ambitious thing about it is that in whatever these number of pages was, there's a lot of characters. And he unfortunately has one girl with pink hair and then one girl with kind of reddish hair. And I was like, they're too yeah. close. <laughs> but yes. other than that, I, I, I think that the artist, Jacob Edgar, who I do not know, was perfect for this thing. The, oh, yeah, the it was cartooning, great. You know, and the, the characters and the faces. Other than that one little bit that I just mentioned, like, I knew who everybody was. And there are a fuck ton of characters. I mean, that was, that, that was high-end work. So Wilson is the, the mustachioed man who brings them all together. And oh, and Wilson. I'm a little or concerned because I thought as, as a society, we all sort of had an unspoken agreement. You know, fashion comes and goes, right? Uh -huh. so fashion is always coming back, right? It's been, we've been in a 90s thing for a while, but, you know, 70s fashion comes back into style. We always just jump over the 80s. Like, we all just decided that was a mass, Not like, anymore. hallucination. We should have been dressed like that. Why it happened, we were all worried about getting blown up. You know, all kinds of things are going on, but we just to skip over it. And yet, and yet... Not only here, in the form of this man and his ro his rolled up blazer sleeves, I've seen it in a TV show recently, and I, this will not stand. We are not going back to rolled up we blazers are. for men. No. And the, the, the Connor, the mullet came back in a non ironic fashion. We cannot let this stand. We've already let stand the idea that people are okay wearing pants that don't reach their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done it? Have you done it though? <laughs> I saw a guy with a suit, and it looked like the suit he was wearing had been shrunk three sizes. I remember when that started, like a few years ago. I'd see, I don't know, I was looking at an Esquire or something. I had, and I was like, "What is this?" And it was, it was, it was suggesting, and that was years ago. Oh yeah, no, it's been over ten years. I've seen it come in, and it, it's, yeah, it rubs me wrong. It's not. Good. Anyway, it makes my legs look shorter, and I don't need that. I will not stand for the eighties coming back, and I will not stand for men rolling up or pushing up their blazer sleeves. You are not Don Johnson. And this is not 1985. Well, he looks like, this character looks like a mix be, cross between Owen Wilson and um, Matthew McConaughey in Dazed and Confused. <laughs> anyway. I like that you can't put your finger on this character, by the way. Like, Oh, yeah, for sure. 
Uh, this is fun. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I, for, for mostly it was just fun. In that one main scene, which took up most of the issue, where they're all talking at the same time, and the art was really strong. So I don't know where this is going. I'm not sure what even is happening. Mm-hmm. But I enjoyed it quite a bit. Yeah, I did too. It's good. Yeah. Do you read Predator? Here, so here's what happened. Okay. I, I, so we, we had that first Predator issue. Was it a patron pick? Mm, it might have been. been. And I, I enjoyed it. And so I saw Predator 4 this week, and I went, oh, shit, did I miss the last issue? And I didn't read 2 or 3. It's absolutely the kind of book that you would skip over when making your list, because who would think it's worth buying a Predator book? Right. I thought about it. I was like, but I'd have to read three issues, and I didn't have time. So I was like, oh, fuck it. I haven't stopped reading it. It's a lot like Alien in that way. First of all, Kev Walker is an artist who I buy what he draws pretty yeah. much without fail, because I, I just love his stuff ever since I, I first saw him on Thunderbolts years ago. I want to download it now while you're talking. I, I, I meant to read it, I just didn't. And it, it's like, it. it's a very straightforward story, but there's a thing that is happening. Marvel has gotten some of these licenses, the Predator license, the Aliens license, mm-hmm. and historically, these kind of licensed books are not memorable. Right. Same with the Conan books, actually, too. They sort of go into basically took all of all of Dark Horse's <laughs> licensed properties. Ouch. But they're approaching them with a little more professional edge. They got better artists on them. They got better writers on them. I'm sure that some of those other books were good, but these are good. They're not blow you out of your socks. Oh my god, I can't believe what they're doing here. It's not G.I. Joe Cobra, if we were in a way back in history. No, but they're putting solid people on them. Before right. you have just... people you never heard of. These are solid people. But they're just fun. Yeah, like, they're fun. It's just like this Predator book is fun. It's not breaking the mold. It's not creating some new thing, but I look forward to it. I look forward to that Alien book. They're good licensed books that have, you know, solid professional comic book folks on it. And it isn't like you'll see other licensed books from, we'll say, publishers with less resources, you know, Mm -hmm. and they they got Bush League. To be fair, I mean, that's what Marvel can do. They can afford to do it. Exactly. And so that helps. Again, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's not... You know, I'm not going to be like, oh, man, this, this is it's not the Flintstones, you know, where we were right. like, my God, this book is amazing. But it's real fun. And also because it's so Predator, like, you know, it's dumb. You don't have to – there's not much you have to do with it. You just have to create a story and, and, and have it go this main character is interesting and her story is and the world they're living in. Like, we get to learn about all that stuff. But it's not encumbered by anything else. This doesn't matter what's happening in another book. You just get to tell that story. And, you know, because Alien had been so successful and fun – you know, I, I stuck with this for a bit, and uh, it's it's great. I look forward to it. It's not amazing. I just downloaded it all it's while fun. you were talking. I want to give credit where credit's due. Comicsology did an update this week, and, and downloading is now much faster than it was since they changed nice. over. It's a much, nice. much faster experience. Anyway, I'm looking forward to reading two through four. I literally had the same thought. I was like, oh, I did, I have I been reading this? And I went, oh, shit, I, I haven't. And I was a little disappointed, and, but I just didn't have time to pick awesome. up three extra issues. So <laughs> I'll, I'll read them over the weekend. Night of the Ghoul number two. Scott Snyder, Francisco Francovia. I read the first issue and really enjoyed it. It was really a fun sort of uh, horror but cinema experience where this guy, you know, it was a filmmaker and there's a ghoul and they brought back from World War I. And this is produced by Dark Two. Court. Two, I was about four or five pages in and I went, I don't really care anymore. And I, I had to pull up the first issue again because I remembered mm-hmm. nothing. I pulled up the first issue. I went to like the last five pages. Like, oh, okay, right. I got this. And then I sort of moved forward. I think that the combination of Francesco Francovia and Scott Snyder in this is what makes it work for me. And this is not the kind of story I, I normally like. I think Snyder's having a real renaissance lately. Not oh, for sure. Sort of, we've seen it with a lot of things. But, you know, when he's he's away from all that DC stuff, I guess his imagination's going. But then he's also bringing to it all that experience that he has now in um, toning down some of his proclivities. If I, if I might say so. I mean, it's, it's not a bad comic for sure. I just, I thought, I, you know, the first issue was like a really good short story. Mm-hmm. It even ended in a way that the story could have ended on, you know, yeah, like okay. the monster was right there. And I thought it was a really nice single issue. And then when it, with this issue, I just was like, I don't really care about what happens next. I just thought that first issue was a really strong, sure. complete piece. I just, it has that great, to me, it has that great pulp feeling. Mm-hmm. Where it feels like an old comic and a new comic at the same time. You know, it's the same thing where I say I don't like horror, but genre doesn't matter if you're enjoying something. And, and you know, again, not my favorite book, but I like being surprised by a guy who I thought I had pinned down uh, in Scott Snyder. And I think that this is you know, this is just another one. Like, I, I I went out of my way. I was like, oh, right. I, I, this was, it was sort of a unique yet familiar at the same time. Uh, this man is it. vomiting my maggots. Yeah, I mean, it's a horror book. Don't get me wrong. It's like, a, <laughs> it's like an old-timey kind of horror book. 
I love when Frank Avia signs his panels. <laughs> I was watching something. I was looking at something, I, I, some show or something, and I was like, what's that image from? And then I zoomed in. I could see his signature. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> He's great. He's really, really great. Yes. So those are the books we wanted to talk about. It was just somewhat of a light week, but over at patreon.com slash ifanboy, the patrons can vote to add a book to the rundown. And this week, the winner... Well, by a fairly solid margin, it was Batman and the Joker, Deadly Duo, book one from Black Label at DC, written and drawn. I think no credits page in this book, so this is all supposition. Written and drawn by Mark Silvestri with colors by R.F. Prianto. No idea who lettered it because, again, no credits page. That's all. On this digital version. I find this really interesting to read. And not even for the subject matter, just, just from a sort of a comic book history perspective. You know, Mark Silvestri, for those who are listening who don't know, was one of the founders of Image Comics, right? Huge artist in the early 90s doing X-Men books. Goes over, does Cyberforce at Image. And was part of that whole crew of Jim Lee and, and Rob Liefeld and Todd McFarlane and Eric Larson and Jim Valentino. And, you know, really haven't seen anything from him in decades. You know, Jim Lee we see all the time at DC. Rob Liefeld is popping up here and there. Eric Larson has been doing Savage Dragon without stopping. Haven't really seen Jim Valentino very much. Todd McFarlane has basically stopped drawing, but he's still around doing stuff. Sylvester's name, I mean, I know Sylvester went off and he did a lot of Top Cow stuff. He did uh, Witchblade, things like that, but really haven't seen much from him. I feel like he's shown up on, like, he did, like, a couple of X-Men issues here and there, like special event kind of things. Maybe. I just haven't seen it. And so I was reading the book almost from a art history perspective because I think of all of those guys Silvestri might have the art style that has evolved the most into an almost of modern style. I can see that. Because here this is a very it's still a very Mark Silvestri book but it's a softer more human art style whereas Jim Lee's style is basically the same. It's <laughs> it's a lot of hard lines and it's rigid and, and people stand on like stand on like statues and that can be good or bad. Eric Larson's styles never changed from the early 90s, and it's, it's totally unique, and I wouldn't pigeonhole him in any way, but it's it's wholly his style. And nor would we want it to change. Yeah, Liefeld's style is what it is. It's, it's the same. Valentino's style's always been an early 90s comic was the next style. It's not what we're talking about here. And Todd McFarlane, who knows? He doesn't really draw anymore. But I remember Silvestri being, you know, he was in this Jim Lee school, I remember there was, I always remember there was some joke where like he drew a crowd scene, but they were all, they were all like from one of those team books, probably Cyberforce, where they were all talking, but they were all facing straight up and down towards the camera. So it was like, they were all standing in like a police lineup. It didn't look natural at all. And that was sort of the, to me indicated his style, but it seems like a lot has changed. I just found it interesting the way his art has evolved in, in however 30 years or however long it's been. It, it doesn't, it's not gonna be for everybody, but I found, oh, this, this is a guy who is, worked on his craft in the last 30 years because it's not exactly the same as he used to draw. I'm going to admit something then. Mm-hmm. I I didn't realize he was drawing it mm. because of the way that the credits don't exist. On the, mm-hmm. on the cover, it says Mark Silvestri and Arif Pinto. Is that, is that the name? Prianto. Prianto, He's sorry. Colorist, who also colored Dark Knights of Steel. So I thought, oh, he he wrote it and this other person. Like, that's as far as I got. Right. And it's funny because the cover looks like uh, Mark Silvestri and it's not a good cover. Yeah, and then as you go through it, and I don't even think I, this is that first page. You look and you you see um, Harley Quinn. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a great page. Yeah, it is. It's a really good page Dynamic. for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, the sketchiness I think really. I love the sketchiness of it. Yeah, you know, it looks like it's not so far removed from Sinkevich inking yeah. it, you know, or something like that. So then you get to the end, and there's like these are the pages inked by Mark, and it's like five pages. So what I thought in my mind was that he wrote this, and they inked like five or six of the pages. And mm-hmm. I was like, that's lame. Now that you're saying he drew it, by the way, the pages he inked are not the better pages, pages in it. Just point <laughs> that out. The, uh, the inking and the color add a lot to this. But I can't take away some really nice storytelling. A, a lot of really good insert panels. There's a page, page 20. You see through a lens the gift package that was what the Joker left to Batman on the rooftop with the bat signal. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see it through a lens. You get closer. You see the actual tag. You see Batman come down to it. You know, it, it, we spend the whole the whole page sort of going further into this box, yes. you know, which isn't a big deal. But I think from a storytelling standpoint, from a comic book page construction, it's pretty good. You know, the action stuff looks good. He he he's very 
he'll zoom right into faces and pull back out. Gotham looks like it's supposed to. I'm actually really impressed now that I know that this is Sylvester. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I thought I was not looking forward to this in any way. Sure, I, I know you wouldn't be. And then I will say that by the end, it's not my favorite. I like I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I expected to hate it though, and I didn't. I came away impressed. Well, because it it felt to me like a very throwbacky Batman story in in, the, yes. in that it's a Gotham. It's not you know it's black label. It's not in continuity. It's both a modern and a old. Go- you know Harley Quinn is a villain, which I loved right out of the gate. Yeah. I was like, oh great, she's such a great villain, and we've lost that character, and now here she is again. And you know Gordon is is the commissioner, although he's off fishing, and <laughs> Bullock is there. You know, Batman's costume is a little bit modern. It's got a terrible belt, but it still felt very sort of old DC, old Gotham. And I like that bit. And they're trying to make this out like Batman and the Joker teaming up is some revolutionary story idea. I've been reading that for like the last two years in Sean Murphy's Black Label Batman book. So it's not like it's not like, well, this is the same thing happening in another Black Label book. It's not that big a deal. You know, they have to team up here and that's fine. And also didn't Scott Snyder's metal book as well. It's like, it's not like, it's not a huge. It's also, not... the imposter Jokers is happening over in Matt Rosenberg's Joker book right now. And, you know, this is, there's, there's bits in here that aren't so far from the Gotham year one. <laughs> like, so there's nothing original. No, it's just funny because they're, they're marketing as like, like the, the right. team up you never thought would happen. It's like, well, it's happening in like five books. Yeah, but that's comic books. That's what yeah. they do. That's like political. Sp- I really like the page on, uh, what page number is this? Page 22, right after the, the rooftop thing where the Joker is hanging off the roof. Like, that's a great yeah. downward angle on him. And then the next page still, we're like sort of off his nose. Yeah, and, and it, the finishing on it really gives you that, like a, a view of what this Joker's face is. Mm-hmm. It's like a combination of classic Joker and a little bit of um like Heath ledger Joker. Yeah. Yeah, it's really nice. And you know what? Like, you know, the bit where he's, the three panels where he falls off and the last one where he's hanging, that last panel's great. The last panel's really great. Really, like the, yeah. the the feet in the foreground and his hands are uh, like he's he's acting at the same time. This would change my stance on a Mark Silvestri. That's why I found it so interesting. I, honestly, gun to my head, I, I don't really remember the details of the story. I was really looking at it from an art point of view. Like, mm-hmm. what has he done in the last 30 years? Because I really haven't seen his art. And I was like, wow, I was re- I'm really impressed by this. Of those guys, he seems to have made the biggest leap. And I wouldn't. And he was a that. superstar. Like I'm not saying he was. Oh sure. But he was very, very popular, and you know, could draw very well. But like I feel like he's made the biggest leap into sort of modern, modern right. art of all of these guys, and I, I'm really impressed by it. Yeah, I expected this was going to look like when you know Liefeld does something. I'm like, what's well, right. Liefeld doing his thing? But I mean, this doesn't look so different than like this is better than Finch, and Finch is kind of a Sylvestri. Oh yeah, Finch lady. and. Finch and Tony Daniel, they're all in that Sylvester school. Right. I thought about that reading this too. I'm actually happy, A, that he did this and B, that it was the Patriot because I probably wouldn't have read it. Agree. Yeah. That was the big surprise. Like I finished it and I was like, wow, I was actually impressed. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> it's not a pick of the week, but it's no. it was not a slog in any way. It actually yeah, felt pretty short. It was uh, slightly oversized, not too big. I did check that at the beginning. I was like, how many pages is this? Because I was like, please don't be 65 pages. This feels 48 pages. Nope, 33. I'm, I'm actually probably going to read th- the whole thing just because I'm curious to see how it looks more than anything. Hmm. You might have convinced me to do that. Yeah. And it, 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 it's just interesting from that point of view, like that whole school of guys that started Image, um, you know, they're all still, I mean, I, don't, I actually don't know what Valentina's been doing. I'm sure it's something, but they're all, they all still work, but it's just... You know, I, I know if, if you tell me Rob Liefeld's drawing a book, I know what it's going to look like. If you tell me Jim Lee's going to draw a book, I know what it's going to look like. If you tell me Eric Larson's going to draw a book, I know what it's going to look like. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what the book was going to look like, and I was really impressed by it. Tell me Greg Capullo's going to draw a book. I know what it's going to look like right. McFarland. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you tell me McFarland's going to draw a book, I actually don't know what it's going to look like. So that, in that sense, I'd be excited, too. Now, he doesn't draw anymore. He That's what I mean. Is. That's why I don't know, because he hasn't drawn anymore. Mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting when you think about some of the guys from that era who were so like lauded and now they ink stuff every once in a while and like that's mm-hmm. really, like a Sinkevich. And like I I don't know if McFarland's like this. I love the idea of a person like McFarland inking something. I think that's super interesting to watch what happens. The same well, those, way he was inking Sinkevich. Spawn for a long time. Yeah. I'm cool with that. But it'd be cool if he just inked like some other random book. Wouldn't it be cool to see like him ink uh, uh <laughs> Ramita Jr. or something like didn't Sinkevich do that? Didn't he Well Sinkevich ink- was inking Mike Norton forever. Yeah. It was great, though. It's such a style clash. 
I know, but it worked. I would never have picked that, but he he is. And, yeah, or he did. I'm sorry. I know I'm talking about a slightly different thing, but no, it's fine. The pages that he inked Silvestri in this, he inked that really great face close up. He inked the whole book. They just picked out four pages to really? look to, to show you. Inked. He, okay, he inked the I whole just book. read it wrong. It wasn't put together well. No. That first page, I think, sells it. Is the in you know the rat? Oh, the first. I, I, that's the, when I opened the page, and I was like, "Oh, yeah." Like, whoa! This is not what I was expecting. So, speaking of McFarlane, I know we're, not, we're going off on a tangent, but he has a Batman Spawn one shot coming out in December that Capullo is drawing. Mm-hmm. I, wonder, I wonder if he's inking it, McFarlane. Written by McFarlane, drawn by Capullo. Nice. Interesting. Doesn't say who's inking it. I just wish he would draw again. Just because, let's not go off on an image rabbit hole. It's not gonna. It's <laughs> not, like, if he was gonna do it, he would have done it. And that's tough. I mean, like if you think about, think about how often we used to write, just mm-hmm. for I family. And like, I am so out of shape on that <laughs> front. Mm-hmm. Like it's hard. I used to be able to say a thousand words, no problem. Like I could do eight hundred words in my sleep. Yeah. Tried doing it recently. It's hard. Well, it's a, it's a skill and a muscle like anything else. Right. Creative work is not something you just But the do. skill of sort of ramping up to pencil or ink or do both through an entire comic book issue of sequential art, if you haven't been doing it regularly, that has got to be a bear. I'm sorry, Josh. I want him on a monthly book <laughs> right now. So that was the patron pick. Patreon.com slash iFanboy is how you can become a patron and vote to add a book to the rundown. But if you give it the $5 or higher level... You get a superpower live on the show, a patron power, as we call them, for you and you alone. It's bespoke. Mm-hmm. We put a whole team of people, researchers, into finding the right power just for you. And now Artists Josh is going to bestow people. this artisanal power on this patron. Well, I would say it was about two minutes ago when I thought, Josh, did you write something down? <laughs> and then I found I had written something down. And then I thought, Josh, did you use this already? So here goes. <laughs> Tom Cree... Can add or remove influence from influencers. Oh. He can say, this one deserves no more influence, and (laughs) they will be gone, as their influence will no longer have any effect. But some people, he can add influence and therefore raise those voices slightly. Tom Cree could make a lot of money. But also he can shape the world. I know. I'm just saying, I know people who hire him right now. I know agencies that would hire him right now and pay him a lot of money. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, it has to be an existing influencer. Sure. Although, sure. what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> can I tell you a story? Quick oh, one. Oh boy, we can't stop you. Somebody started a storefront business in my town, mm-hmm. and it is a social media marketing concern. In your town? Yes. And it's a <laughs> storefront, and the idea was that. It's got a green screen, and you can go oh, in there yeah, yeah. and work on stuff and make it. they got a ring light you can see in the windows next to the Domino's Pizza. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've never seen a single person in there. <laughs> you should go in there and shoot some of my fanboy content. I, I guess I could. Uh, it's, it was like they had this idea, like, I think there's a real wellspring in- of, <laughs> of, of really serious and invested social media influences. In suburban New England. Yeah. Yeah. He's like those guys that in like L.A. or New York that have like warehouses and inside the warehouse are like fake private jet sets and things that were, right. you can go and rent it out or fake like luxury apartment sets for uh, social media shoots. It was for pornography and then it was <laughs> repurposed. Right. That's really funny. That's a good power for Tom Cree. He can shape the world. Yeah. Yeah. You can make a difference. And you can be like, we, I don't, I don't want to see this anymore. Patreon.com slash iFanboy. That's where you can go and give it the $5 high level. Josh, why don't you really quickly run down? All this next segment, even though it says me, it should be you. That's fine. Patreon.com slash iFanboy is the way that you can most directly influence and support the program. Everybody there is part of a really good community. You can find those communities over on Facebook and on Discord, and they are a highlight uh, of our lives, I think, in that way. We are going to announce new stretch goals. We will have new stretch goals announced for you at the at the beginning of next year. Yeah, there it is. Sure. I put a deadline on it. So that's when that's happening. I have a spreadsheet. It's right here. It's I called know. new stretch goals. And I've been Occasionally when I'm out in the world, I think, I just call Connor right now. We're going to make this meeting. we got to do it. And then something <laughs> happens and I forget. And then we're doing the show live and yeah. then say this. But that's our goal. That's our deadline. We're good with deadlines. Very good with deadlines. Where is my spreadsheet? 
ifanboy.threadless.com. There are 12 designs on T-shirts and more, including our newest design. Gosh, I was just thinking about that as I was wearing my uh, my uh, Clint is Dead shirt. I almost said the H word, which oh. would be some sort of copyright infringement that I'm not going to get involved with. And then I thought of the Gosh shirt. And I was like, man, we got lucky with a couple of those designs from, uh, from Tio. And I've got my uh, Clint is Dead skateboard, which I have not built into a real skateboard yet. Are you going to? I can't not build a skateboard deck into a skateboard. I thought you were going to hang it up like art. I, yes, but it feels like I don't like things that are functional not being used as function. You know what I mean? Like it's mm. a skateboard. It it wants to be skated. Mm. Like I wouldn't want a guitar that I kept in a glass case and couldn't play. What so, if it was George Harrison's guitar? I would want to play it. What if it was signed? I would still want to play it. Mm. I have, uh, I mean, like I have a couple of guitar pedals that are signed by Kevin Shields um, from My Bloody Valentine, and I play them. Like, they're on my board. Like, things should be used. That's my deal. So That's the sound of me silently exchanging your Christmas list. Were you going to buy me George Harrison's I guitar? Not anymore. You're going to play it. <laughs> he would want that. <laughs> or he would want to garden. One of the two. <laughs> uh, I, he fucking loved gardening. I find that fascinating. He was... <laughs> He was the crankiest enlightened person ever. Yes. Direct donations you can give through uh, ifamo.com slash support through PayPal. ifamo.com slash Amazon. You can buy the books that are listed in Books Blowed. You can find the music from the shows. Uh, we, we link that where, where it's appropriate. Bookshop.org. We have partnered with bookshop.org to help out local bookstores, and you will find those links where they are appropriate. There's a place where they connect you with real local bookstores that sort of help those small businesses that are super important to our culture in ways that we, I don't know, I don't think we can fathom. I recommend reading Empire of Pain by Patrick Ratton Keefe. <laughs> It's fucking fascinating. Or not. That's true. That's true. It'll, <laughs> it'll make you angry. It should, if it doesn't. So there you go. Thanks for being supporting the show. We do appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. Literally, the show would not go on. And look, we're short enough. We can do an email, Josh. Look at that. We did wow. it. Wow. We actually did it this week. Okay. Andrew from Bem- Bemidji? Bemidji. Bemidji. Bemidji, Minnesota. I've been thinking about this question for probably a year, and it's about Wolverine. At one point, and for a long time, he was at the top two Marvel character in terms of popularity with only Spider-Man possibly beating him out. Now in 2022, it seems he might not even be in the top five. I'm sure he still gives books a boost, but not nearly as much as in the 90s and 2000s. What do you think the reason is he lost his spot? The MCU is probably a big part of it, but I, I wonder if taking him out of the traditional costume really hurt his popularity. Interested in hearing your thoughts. It's an interesting question. I think it's fair to say that Wolverine at some point was replaced by Deadpool as that character. Okay, interesting question is, the first thing is, does any character put on the cover raise sales? Because that's what he's talking about. Right. In the 90s, in the late 80s, early 90s, you put Wolverine on a Marvel Comics cover, you're selling, Mm -hmm. I'm making up a number, 10,000 more units than you do. Movie units. That's just what happened. And suddenly he was on every cover in every comic because of that. And I don't know that there's any character. And the same thing for DC was Batman. You put Batman in a book, the book sold more units. And I don't know if that's still a thing or not. It may, but the fact that it doesn't happen anymore tells me it doesn't. But that's the thing. And I don't know if putting Deadpool in a book does that even. I don't know. But I do know that it's got nothing to do with his costume because in the period of time we're talking about, he had two different costumes. Also, I mean, it, like it, he's not in the MCU necessarily, but if we're talking about any other non-MCU movie character wolverine slash logan has had a lot of success and a lot of mainstream recognition so it's not like it's not like he's oh yeah he was hugely popular in that i mean the x-men hugh jackman's a star because he played wolverine right but that doesn't mean that wasn't a contributing fact like look partially it's because in the 80s and 90s marvel was all about the x-men those were the top selling books Mm -hmm. everything Mm -hmm. in the universe ran through the x-men books the, the top talent was on it it was their f- focus. So the biggest character in the biggest books was Wolverine. And then in 2000, it changed to the Avengers. The Avengers took over as the main focus of the Marvel Universe through Bendis. And hey, the Wolverine was in that book too. And why? Because it's super popular. But the focus changed from the X-Men to the Avengers. And the, the Avengers held that spot for like 15 years. And now I would say there's no... Team books seem to not matter anymore. Comics are so weird right now. Yes. I bet like a small, like a low-selling book, like an expected low-selling book, gets a little bit of a boost from. It's possible. 
it's totally possible. It's just it's just that the focus of the, of everything changed, and the MCU certainly is a possible contributor. But you had the, the shift from, from the X Men to the Avengers. You had the movies, but again, Hugh Jackman's Wolverine is incredibly popular. And still is. Oh, for sure. There's no shortage of seeing people dressed up like him at cons. Or the internet lost its mind when the whole Deadpool video right. came out with him in it. Like he, it's still, it's just things change. The market changed about characters and creators driving sales like that. Uh, I don't know if it's because casual readers are not around anymore. I don't know what it is. Do you have any idea what the threshold is for like, like a Marvel or DC book? You know, like acceptable sales. No, I mean we've been so out of the game for so long in terms of yeah. In terms of, I was thinking about that the other day. Like we used to know everything going on in the industry when we were doing like fanboy full time, but now we don't. I would be interested to. See, I know we have some retailers listen. I'd be interested to know if sales on a book go up if a guest character is featured on the cover. And I also, bet on a store level, small, medium sized comic book. Say that you've got an issue of Miss Marvel out. Mm-hmm. And you put Wolverine or Deadpool on the cover like that. That's going to cause a couple more people to pick up and look at that book, and they might sell a handful more copies. Right. I think that that's possible. And if that fans out, then it'll give you a little bump, you know, single right. digits, right? Percentage. It's. It, it, I mean, it. It's almost like he's the bellwether character for the change in the industry because the, the comics industry worked in a certain way when Wolverine was incredibly popular, mm-hmm. and then the comics industry changed in the in, in the late nineties, two thousands. And it's totally, and even between. I think it's later than that. I mean, no, I but it, first, well, it changed first to from X Men to Avengers focused, and then it changed again a decade later, where the things that used to drive sales don't drive them anymore. And those were the things that drove sales for like decades, and they're just gone. I think that's because of the, of the readership. It feels like, and I have no data to back this up, but the readership for mainstream monthly comics is very you could either say stable or stagnant it's the Mm -hmm. same people and they don't necessarily get excited about things the way that people used to in the past because they've been around so long that it's very easy they know what to expect from stuff Mm -hmm. and so they're very like the bells and whistles don't work in the same way like they know what they want to buy there's a couple. I mean, like when when Donny Cates and Ryan Segman did Venom, like that got people excited and moved books in a way that I don't think uh, like an old timey kind of way. You know what I mean? Right. Like you, you know. But even that stuff, that's throwback stuff. That's retro modern, you know, stuff. It's also interesting because I think about this a lot. Like, how and why did the team book become totally irrelevant? Justice League and Avengers. X Men are sort of a weird class on all its own. There's this weird subculture. People, are, if you're into X Men, you're super into X Men, but that that's no longer the majority of comics readers like it used to be. So why are these team books totally irrelevant? It's interesting. It doesn't matter who you put on them. You could go cultural and say, you know, like maybe we have a more individualist dick focused society and therefore those i mean I, it, there's all sorts of theories that you sort of never work out I it mean, happened the same time as the event book becoming irrelevant i don't know what I, I don't know it's just it's just an interesting way that the industry has changed you know n- n- no one cares about what happened I don't, I don't even know is there a justice league book i don't even know uh i mean isn't that what dark crisis is right now I guess, yeah, you're right. They, they, they canceled it for Dark Crisis, but like, I, I didn't even, I couldn't even tell you, off the top of my head, w- <laughs> without you prompting me, if there was Justice League comic com- coming out. Uh-huh. Like that's a, how irrelevant they, it's become. It's crazy. It doesn't it doesn't really bode crazy. well? I mean, it yeah, doesn't bode well for people who like comics like we do. Yeah. Meaning, you know, the the monthly, you know, tr- sort of. I like so you know I like some of the tradition in it. I'm not I'm not, I'm not made of stone. I remember when we when when Marvel said, well, I don't even know they did. They said it pretty clearly, like we're gonna renumber volumes. Everything's kind of a mini series. They're having it both ways. And I thought we you and I were both like, ugh, that sounds awful. And it is awful, but it isn't not working for them. Mm-hmm. You know, unfortunately, but you know the the culture and society have changed so much in that time. I mean. It's, it's not hard to say, well, what happened in that time? Well, social media happened in that time. Same timeline. 
something happened yes. in in the terms of consumption that affected everything and you know and and you know television streaming you know that's the rise of this new version of take exactly what you want a retail basically when we you know were graduating college and starting out you were getting back into comics and we were starting i fanboy the two most exciting books over that span of five or so years was JLA at DC and New Avengers at Marvel. They were the two most exciting and important books. JLA was the most important book DC was publishing in the late 90s, and New Avengers was the most important book that Marvel was publishing in the 2000s. Everybody read both those books. Both those books drove the ethos of the publishing companies. Everything at Marvel ran through New Avengers. JLA re reformed the whole universe tonally, character-wise. And both of those books are completely irrelevant. Here's another sociological perspective, sort of related. The monoculture is gone. I mean, there's like in the same way that with the, you know, JLA, there's no TV shows mm -hmm. like that are, you know, the, the thing that everybody, there's no ER. Just, Justice League is the ER, you know, of the network that is those comics. And that doesn't happen anymore. And so, or, or like, um, blockbuster music artists like there isn't one thing that everybody knows anymore because that's not how media works anymore right, right. i mean there are there are there are certainly um superstars like taylor swift sure the album came out this, this week but like they don't sell us like they used to and right they don't really create them they're those are also legacy artists in a way which is crazy yeah to say, but she is no it's true it's true i don't believe that jack harlow is an actual celebrity i believe he's a construct <laughs> That was a very confusing Saturday Night Live. I didn't see it. What is going on here? I've been saying that since the <laughs> NBA playoffs last year, because all of a sudden, because I don't know anything, he shows up in like half the commercials, and he was on the court in one of them, and I go, Lindsay, who is that? And she's like, I think it's a rap person, because there was a meme. There were like two refs saw him on the side of the thing. I'm like, who is that? And I'm like, I think he's a rapper. My daughter knows him or whatever. And then he just started showing up and everything, and I was like, I think this guy's fake. I don't think he's an actual celebrity. Then well, he's on SNL. He's following the path of an actual celebrity. Well, watch his SNL. It, it won't clear it up for you. <laughs> anyway, it's it's interesting. Wolverine is sort of like a bellwether character, Andrew. Like he, Andrew is right to say that he was once the most important character in comics, and he's still incredibly popular. And he still has, has a super high, you know, public awareness quotient for a character that hasn't been in this giant Marvel movies. It just he's not the same. Doesn't hold the same spot in in comics that he used to. You know, society and culture have changed a lot. I think it's all yeah. part and parcel. But it's not the costume. It's but. not the. It's definitely not the costume because I don't think anybody actually has comic book people have an idea about what the costume is. But the rest of the world doesn't because he doesn't wear the costume in the movies and it didn't matter. Not even comic people because some people say it's the yellow and blue costume. Some That's what I mean. Say like, it's the brown no, costume. Right. There's, there's there's not a. I couldn't even tell you which one of those is better. The brown and yellow one was the first one, but I, then I saw the tiger stripey one. I was like, oh, that's cool too. But he looks all right in both of them. And then the first X-Men movie happens in 2000. They're black leather. That happens yeah. then in uh, Grant Morrison's X-Men book. Yeah, He's got no costume. That has nothing to do with it. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, even, if, a, that, even if you just take the herring. traditional costume, like when, when he was incredibly popular, he wore both costumes. Yes. Tell you what, what's much more uh, iconic than the costume is the hair. As long as the hair is there in some form, you'll be all right. Great question, though, Andrew. Great question. Thank you for writing in. Contact at ifanboy.com is how he got on the show. And you can do that, too. Also, you can write in to be on our Mediasplode show. If you do that, please write Mediasplode in the subject line so we know which folder to put it into. That's a very important folder maintenance. Out right now. <laughs> We have two special edition shows that was came such out recently. An honor thing to say. <laughs> special edition <laughs> review of Black Adam, <laughs> which is hilarious because like your desktop and my desktop, mine looks like a like the, the set of Sanford and Son. Mm -hmm. Those are the topical references that the kids come for. Yeah, and yours is very tightly wound, controlled. Mine is like a you million mean, files everywhere. You mean computer desktop? Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, no, I I have I I hate when there's more than anything. If it's more than the right side, if it goes over into a second column, I'm not okay with that. I'm gonna send you a screenshot of my my. Screen I don't want it. Freak out. I, it's gonna blow my entire idea of who you are, and I don't think I can handle it. Special edition Black Adam review. Paul Montgomery, our old co-host, we we talked about it. It was a really interesting discussion. We had a really fun time dissecting that film, and then just this past week. We had our media explode for October. It actually came out in November, but don't tell anybody in the comic book podcasting world. But we'll get shunned. 
uh, Media Explode talking about House of the Dragon and The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, both season one. We talked about those. Really fun discussion. Really dove deep into our fantasy fandom. I, I just okay. keep forgetting, Josh. Be careful. <laughs> I forgot that you have a fantasy fandom, Josh. I forgot that, but you do. Yeah. yeah. And we had a good time talking about that. This coming week, we have a show that's going to come out, and it's going to be a special edition show again, standing in for the talks load because of uh, Josh's time is not spent currently on producing a talks load. It's a very intensive produced show, and he is busy with other things. So we're going to do something. We were just talking about it before the show, what we're going to do, but we haven't decided yet. We have an idea we might do. There's other ideas we might do. The point is something will come out because every week between now and the end of the year, there will be a special edition show of some sort coming out on Thursday. So you'll be looking forward to that. And so that's the holiday schedule. We're now into November. Longtime listeners will know this. New listeners will not. We always take the last part of December off to spend with our families. And so between now and December 18th, there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 shows coming out in the next sort of six weeks. That includes a Black Panther review. That includes our final media split of the year for November. That includes a Super Suns review in December. Our final book split of the year in December, which we need to figure out very soon what we're going to do. So I was going to ask you, I was like, do we have a book? For we don't have a book. We're going to figure that out. What's a 72 page graphic novel that we can do? <laughs> Look at this. Let's read this 20 page graphic novel. Connor, that's a single issue. Shut up. talking about reading a 12 page, 12 <laughs> issue series. That's gone. Well, maybe. Let's figure that out. That's gone. All Media Year and Roundup will come out on December 18th. The final pick of the week will be Pick of the Week 859. It comes out on December 11th. And then we'll be returning in January with Pick of the Week 860 on January 8th. That's the schedule. There'll be lots to do. We always enjoy this end of the year. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy production schedule, but it's a fun one. And we're looking forward to all these shows. So you can look forward to lots of shows between now and December 18th, at which point we'll be taking a break until January 8th. But... Uh, we look forward to all, to all the stuff that's coming out. Speak for yourself, Kilpatrick. <laughs> Head over to ifanboy.com. Find all of our shows in the vast history of comic book writing for all of the talented writers we've employed over the years. Uh, you can go to facebook.com slash ifanboy or follow at ifanboy on Twitter and at ifanboycomics on Instagram. You can find out what the pick of the week is before the show comes out by using those platforms, which are terrible for the world, but hey, we're here. Follow us individually. <laughs> Seals Kilpatrick <laughs> and Jay Flanagan on Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash ifanboy. All the old video shows are up there. We post this show every week. If you are one of those YouTube users, and I, I believe that those exist, apparently they're pushing some kind of subscription on people. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed every single time I've ever turned open that page uh, yeah. for the last three years. Are two? <laughs> I haven't taken the trial yet. I'm not gonna either. No. So the archive is completely up there. I live in fear of clicking the wrong button. Yeah. Start the it's, trial now. It's, no. It's not. A, it's not a cheap <laughs> subscription. No. If it was ten bucks, I would do it just to shut them up. <laughs> If you like the show, please consider leaving a review or a star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, it helps uh, our show. It helps any show you listen to to give them a review. I know we say this every – and I know almost every podcast I listen to says it too, but it's because it's important. If you're considering a holiday gift for us, it would be to leave a review or a star rating. Or cash. Or cash. Obviously cash. If you're an eccentric billionaire, fuck the star rating. That's not for you. We're talking to the non-billionaires here. If an iFanboy listener mm-hmm. happens to win oh, the, the Mega Powerball. Lottery, the, power the Powerball is going to be like $2 billion. Right. If you happen to I, win that. I believe that at least 25% of that should be donated <laughs> ear market. to your, your favorite. Ear market. Yeah. It should be. We'll, we will say, Before you do it, talk to us. We'll set ourselves up as a nonprofit. However, you can get <laughs> the best uh, tax relief from that donation. But I think 25% is fair. Yeah. If you win the Powerball, which is $1.5 at the Time of recording, but by the time they draw, it'll probably be close to two billion, if not you're more. You're not going to feel it. No, just earmark the twenty five percent you're going to get after the lump sum taxes happens. You right. won't feel a difference between, let's say, seven hundred million and five hundred million. You're not going to know no. the difference. No, we will know the difference. Yes, yeah, and 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 I mean, are we going to talk about the word deserve? <laughs> I think owed. Owed is a great word. I like word. that. That's even better than deserved. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like an invoice exists. <laughs> There's this one great big invoice hanging out there between us and the audience for this program. And at some point somebody ha- it's past due. Just pay it. Like come on. <laughs> 
our finance guys are like, this invoice is 10 years overdue. I'm like, yeah, what are you going to, we, we've been saying it for 10 years. On one of those reviews somewhere, it's like, I like the show, but at the end, it just gets beggy and pathetic. <laughs> I think it gets and funnier. I've stopped listening. I do too. But people, what we've learned is that perspective changes drastically from person to person. Sure. And what we think is obviously a joke is beggy. <laughs> it's not taken that way. No. We have the emails to prove that. Where are we in the script? It doesn't matter. Anyway, thanks for leaving a review or star rating if you're a non-billionaire. We appreciate that. That's the best thing you can do for any show you listen to. We don't appreciate non-billionaires as much. I, I'm going to go ahead and be on the record. Yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> what good are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, society's falling into flames. All right, so... Thank you. Thanks for listening. We enjoyed the show. Uh, I'm like, I've got a little, little teary eyed from the, from the laughing. This is a great mm-hmm. balm on our week in a time when life is hard. We like doing it. Hopefully you like listening and we thank you who do. And until next week, I'm Connor. I like the word salve also. It's a salve. Salve, balm. They've all got L's in them. They have subtle L's. Balm. I like creams that have subtle L's in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>